Thank you, Kyle. Thank you again for agreeing to speak with us today. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Kyle Farrar. I'm the Western Program Coordinator at Track Tracker Alliance. I am a research and data analyst focused on environmental justice impacts. Um, and through that EJ lens, looking at exposure assessment and uh, doing risk analyses for uh, marginalized and at-risk communities that are living around oil and gas extraction operations. So a lot of my reports are and analyses are looking at who are the communities who are living closest to oil and gas extraction and uh, then also looking at uh, downstream operations as well, looking at refineries and petrochemical facilities in addition to the upstream uh, extraction sites themselves. Um, our, our work uh, also looks at um, uh, climate equity and climate justice issues. Um, so looking at the impact that fossil fuels have on climate change and how those climate change in our Climate changes are impacting communities in California, but also in other Western states here in California, in the United States and uh, our other offices. Look at other regions of the United States, but we're also focused globally as well. When I think climate justice, I think who has access to resources and who will have access to resources in the future, in addition to who is experiencing the worst impacts of climate uh, of climate change, right? So when we talk about resources, we have to think about water number one. Air is there as well, but water resources um, are a priority. They allow us to grow food. They allow us uh, to continue living, right? Uh, so access to fresh water, drinking water. Uh, so in Western states of the United States, um, there are very, very large political battles that are happening over access to the Colorado River, um, to uh, aquifers underground, and who has the primary rights to those resources. So, uh, and one of the stakeholders there is the oil and gas industry. So, um, California uses a good amount of water for the oil and gas industry. We have, um, for the most part, California has expended and sucked up most of the oil from the reservoirs in the state. So uh, the techniques that are being used in California uh, include steam injection and water flooding, where they take fresh water, turn it into steam, inject it underground, and allow that to sweep oil towards production wells, where they pump it back up out of the ground, right? They do that with water, they do it with steam. So steam is very energy intensive, intensive. the water is very energy intensive, but you know, you don't have to at least boil the water to make it steam. But it's also very resource uh, consumptive. So they are using wat freshwater resources to inject into the ground. And the problem there is unlike, unlike uh, other commercial uses of water, such as agriculture uh, or municipal uses of water, such as drinking water, um, when you take water and inject it into oil, oil and gas formations, either for fracking or for this steam flooding and water flooding, you are completely removing it from the water cycle. So 40% of the water that's used for agriculture goes directly into groundwater or back to surface water. The rest goes into the food you're eating, the re uh, and then everything else besides that is re-evaporated into the air where it can uh, continue in the water cycle. That doesn't happen with the oil and gas industry. Uh, fracking and this enhanced oil recovery, steam injection, uh, injects it into the ground where it is stored there forever. It's contaminated and it is going to live in that ground and be inaccessible to uh, for future use. So, um, so one of the uh, so yeah, so the major concern is we're using these volumes, injecting it, and we are uh, eliminating it from our water cycle and making it inaccessible. So the other issue is that states that are expanding oil and gas extraction, like Colorado, Colorado is uh, has some of the fastest growing oil and gas industry in the country. They are using increasing volumes of water for their hydraulic fracturing operations. They have created uh, midstream operation businesses 
where they have just fresh water transporting these water volumes throughout the state to operators. Um, the largest midstream water delivery operation was just purchased by Chevron in Colorado. So we see as we track water use volumes uh, for hydraulic fracturing operations, we see the water volumes increasing um, at, ver at uh, accelerative rates. So um, for example, 10, 15 years ago, average water use for one fracked well was five to eight gallons. We are up to nearly 15 billion gallons per well fracked in Colorado now with uh, maximum volumes close to 30, uh, 30 million gallons in an individual well, uh, just to frack one well. So they've increased their ability, the operators, uh, oil and gas companies have increased their access to fresh water and in turn are increasing their use of fresh water. So we need to address this, this issue um, and make sure that we are preserving the resources for municipal uses and so that everyone, uh, especially marginalized communities, have access to that water in the future. We're getting a taste of what the future could hold. We're seeing the intensity of wildfires increase. We're seeing um, access to fresh water decreasing. Um, we have, uh, we have wells in the Central Valley that are going dry. Um, there are reservoirs that are drying up in California. Um, and it's going, there's a gap that's gonna have to be filled with, with engineering uh, requirements, of, you know, cleaning wastewater and using that for drinking water resources, desalination things of that nature. These are all energy intensive operations. Um, and unfortunately, unless we get a grasp on where that energy is coming from, that is just going to create a negative feedback loop and continue to act, exacerbate these climate issues. So um, really, you know, the biggest issue is these are all feedback loops. We're gonna have to, we're gonna continue getting our fresh water from somewhere uh, that might be more energy intensive source, uh, sourcing of that water. And if it's not coming from renewables, that's just going to dig us deeper in the hole. So, you know, we really have to get ahead of this on all fronts, um, beginning with uh, renewable energy sources and green energy sources, and also start getting a grip on the water that we are consuming and where it's coming from. So. It really has to start with a transition away from fossil fuels. That is the only way. Uh, otherwise, this feedback loop, this negative feedback loop is just going to continue and everything's just going to exponentially uh, degrade. So a lot of the work that I do starts at the grassroots, uh, starts within the grassroots and builds momentum from the grassroots organizing, right? And so in order to support that grassroots organizing, Organizations like Frack Tracker, um, we use our knowledge and resources to pull data from regulatory agencies and create um, reports and materials that show these impacts. But when regulatory agencies refuse to publish this data, it creates uh, a, a lack of uh, materials that you know that uh, we can use to drive policy change. So uh, it can be intentional, it can be unintentional, right? So uh, we're calling and we work with groups that try to address all of the above to change how regulatory agencies present the data in aggregatable, accessible ways so that we can uh, process that data, create maps, uh, create plots and tables to really show what the impacts are, show who's being impacted. And you know, without that data, you know, um, we can't uh, contest these outright lies that are being made by the oil and gas industry. So um, it's very important. So in, in Colorado right now, there is a 
uh, there is a um, wastewater recycling and water sourcing transparency bill that's uh, in the uh, that's being proposed in the state legislature currently. So we are supporting that, and uh, data that would come from that would support our future analyses. Uh, and we have worked with we work directly with <clears throat> regulatory agencies. Um, such as uh, the Department of, Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania to help them develop their website in a way that uh, makes this data accessible. So we have a lot of experience doing this, working directly with the agencies to show them how data should be presented and uh, should be accessible. So, um, you know, and even in California, there's still a lot of issues in terms of what is available and what is accessible, so. Thank you. Um, I know that wasn't on the on my list of um, the questions, but I I want to I want to see if you have any data on this. Where in general the United States stand on data transparency? I know you did some information sourcing um, in regards to Europe, Western Europe. Where where is the United States on that? transparency yeah <clears throat> you know there's a lot of similar issues uh there's a lot of parallels between data access in the, uh, the eu and data access in the united states so um the department of homeland security censors a lot of data in the united states and there are similar security protocols uh for data in other countries um also you know the eu um may not have access to data from individual countries or know what to provide, uh, even if it's not a security issue. So when it comes to accessing uh, any information on um, refineries, such as uh, such as um, volumes of crude that they are refining and uh, volumes of products that they're uh, that they are putting to market, none of that data is accessible. Uh, we can't get any of it. And, um, you know, we ran into similar issues into the EU, uh, whether it is because of um, security measures or just because of uh, a lack of data uh, collection, you know, uh, at the EU, EU level. Um, I'm not sure. The data might be accessible for some uh, countries and not for others. I wasn't able to really uh, dive that deep into it, unfortunately. So mo environmental monitoring data, uh, while there aren't issues with censorship, there are issues with with recognizing um, the needs of monitoring. So if we're talking about monitoring VOCs near industrial sites, you know, carcinogens and air toxic pollutants, um, or um, or monitoring uh, particulate matter. Um, and other uh, criteria pollutants that are more regularly monitored by the EPA, you know, there's definitely an issue of uh, resolution um, that there's not enough monitoring that's happening. A lot of the monitors aren't in the proper locations. Um, so this is tangential to data transparency, um, but you know, more focus on data collection and utilizing resources uh, uh, effectively. There are independent researcher, particularly in Colorado, um, research of Dr. Detlef Helmig, who is using state-of-the-art VOC monitors to track pollutants from uh, oil and gas well sites, as well as refineries and other uh, um, uh, midstream facilities. And his monitors are much more sensitive and much more accurate than the Colorado state regulatory monitors. Uh, yet the uh, state regulators, you know, refuse to acknowledge a lot of his work and the validity of it. So, um, so much so that the University of Colorado system actually um, removed him from his position at UC Boulder um, because he was monitoring the oil and gas industry, which gives a lot of money to um, to the university system in Colorado. So, you know, this is another issue of data access and transparency, um, but much more uh, related to corruption than censorship. 